Dave Neary. Thank you very much, James. So um, when James asked me to talk about craft and, and, and uh, communities crafting software, I, I thought a lot about the topic and I was trying to figure out, you know, what angle can I come at this thing from? And um, one of the things that, when I think about craft and, and attention to detail, one of the games that I love is Go. Anybody here know what Go, right? That's a good spellering. Um, it's a traditional game from Japan, very popular under the name of Baiduk, I think, in, in, uh, in uh, China and in Korea as well. And um, everything about this game is craft. Everything about this game breeds this uh, tradition and culture and attention to detail. One, just a few examples. The board, it, it's a 19 by 19 grid. It looks square. It's not actually square. The, the squares are 13 by 12 in ratio, so that when a player is kneeling beside the board, it looks square when it's foreshortened. And the white stones are slightly smaller than the black stones, because when you have white and black stones that are the same size, side by side, the white stones look bigger. So to compensate for the optical illusion, they make the black stones just a little bigger so that on the board they look the same size. And this is the amount of thought that goes into these kinds of things is amazing. But really, why I thought about Go in the, in the context of today is the way that the best Go players learn to play Go is that they learn from masters. They learn with a master-apprentice relationship. They have... Um, there are Go institutes, uh, the Nihai, the Kensai, Ni... Nobody will know if I get it wrong. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, the Kansai Kiin, is it? Uh, Kosuke? Is that right? Yeah, I was going to say, excellent. someone will know. Yes, <laughs> excellent. Um, and uh, so they, they have institutes where, where young Go players go, and I'm, I'm talking about like professional Go players from the age of 11 and 12, uh, go and they learn with uh, nine Dan masters who've been doing it for 20 years. And this is the way that everything that we consider a craft has been done. We've transmitted from the master to the apprentice. The apprentice becomes uh, uh, a workman, no, tradesman, and then the tradesman becomes a journeyman, and then the journeyman becomes a master and takes other apprentices under his wing. And this is the way that we've always done something. So if software is a craft, then shouldn't we be doing the same thing in community projects and having our senior developers taking new developers under their wings? Uh, but if you look at the way that mentorship has happened in free software projects, there's, uh, th this guy is, is actually a, a hero of mine, a guy called Graham Percival, works in a project called GNU Lily Pond. It's music notation software. So he's a musician who got involved in this project uh, as a kind of a side thing. And um, one year, 2008, he decided that he was going to move on from the project. And uh, rather than just leave, like most of us would do when we got sick of contributing to a, to, to a project in our spare time, decided we didn't have any time for it anymore. He said, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give it a year. And I'm gonna spend, instead of developing the software, I'm gonna spend all of my time training new people to replace me, right? I'm gonna full on apprenticeship, full on mentorship for a year. And I'm gonna keep track of how much time I spend and how much I get back out of that time that I invest with people I mentor. And his finding at the end of the year was that he'd spent about 800 hours uh, training people up and had gotten about 600 hours worth of it, 600 to 900 hours, depending on how he counted, of effort back at the end of the year from people who had continued working on the project afterwards. So he, he considered that he was, he was a failure because he had only just about break in, broken even. He would have been, as far as, uh, in, in his words, he would have been better off doing the work himself. Um, but I think he was being hard on himself. This is his success rate. This is, in terms of the number of contributors, he, he, he found that one in four contributors stayed on in the project long enough uh, to reap the rewards of the time that he invested in their, in the, in their training. Um, FreeBSD did a follow-up after the summer, Google Summer of Code, great program, um, did a follow-up in 2008 on 58 uh, alumni of that program. Uh, in FreeBSD and OpenBSD. Of the 58, only 11 were still active in the project. GNOME Women's Outreach in 2006. This is a program that uh, the GNOME project put in place. Uh, I'm involved in GNOME. And uh, we put this project in place because uh, for the Google Summer of Code project in 2006, we had 200 and something applicants. All of them were men. 
we had 35 projects that got accepted, and we said, well, let's take all of the money that Google are giving to our project, and let's do a project specifically for women. Because when we asked the women contributors in GNOME, to, you know, why, why, aren't, why aren't women applying for the Google Summer of Code in, in GNOME? And they didn't hear about it. They hadn't heard about it. So we said, well, let's, let's focus on women then. Let's make sure that we're, uh, we're being a project that's attractive to women. And we did six projects. And three years later, we did a where are they now type article. None of them were still involved in GNOME. So that's kind of a 0% success rate. Uh, Debian, now this is six months later. So this is plus six months rather than plus a year, or plus two years, or plus three years. Um, of 11 uh, Google Summer of Code participants in 2008 that were not previously Debian developers, only five of them were still involved six months later. So this is, this is still pretty good. So I think we're, we're getting something wrong. We're not doing it well. We're not really doing mentorship the way we did it that we possibly could. And uh, it was really interesting to see all of the presentations yesterday and today because it's kind of been a theme that's been running through. Um, Mike Milinkovic said, uh, you know, we, we keep rediscovering all this stuff, right? We, we, we keep making the same mistakes that other people have made and kind of incrementally rediscovering stuff that people knew today. Donnie mentioned the same thing about, um, what was it, Donnie? Uh, yeah, social, uh, like the, the way that uh, social scientists have been studying communities and interact, social interactions for, for years. So, some of the things I think we do wrong when we're doing uh, mentorship in, in open source projects is that the tasks take too long. Uh, if you look at the kind of things that we give to uh, new participants, uh, apprentices, in programs like the Google Summer of Code, they're, they're summer long programs. So you don't get to fail fast. And I think that's something that's very important, is that um, if a task takes a long time for an apprentice, it's also taking a long time for the mentor to, to mentor that person. And uh, if you look at the Summer of Code, the, one of the things that, that, that Google have said is that more projects uh, fail because of communication issues than anything else. Uh, so there is a mismatch, and this is again something that came through from, from Zach Erlocker's presentation yesterday. Um, if there is no uh, kind of rule to over-communicate, uh, parties will tend to err on the side of not communicating enough. So the student will wait for their mentor to come and ask them if everything is okay. The mentor will assume that the apprentice will ask if there are any problems, and what happens is you, get, you end up digging yourself in holes for weeks and weeks and weeks. So communication failures really... Um, are a huge problem. So this is Simon Phipps coined, this is the Ecclesiastes principle. Uh, there is nothing new under the sun, right? We can learn from other places, like I, I started off, this is the way that trades and crafts have been transmitted for centuries. Uh, there is a wealth of knowledge on how we can train up new talent and bring new people into communities. Um, so why don't we learn from the people who do it well? And some of the people I think that do this well are things like uh, companies. So some of the things that, uh, that companies do, induction programs, uh, executive mentorship, um, job interviews, right? Having some kind of a barrier to entry. These are things that, that, that enabled you to have a higher success rate of integrating people. Uh, sports teams, some of the things that sports teams do, like, like sports academies, um, working with schools, so that you're getting the best student athletes into your sports academy. Uh, shout at me here. Some of the things that sports teams do to get good talent. Scouting. Uh, what was there? there was another one over here? Spend stupid amounts of money. Make people famous, right? Uh, we, we've got that in free software. Um, and, and another thing I think is a nice analogy is, is moving house. When you are a new contributor to a community, it's kind of like uh, being new in a neighborhood, right? Everybody's had the opportunity to move house or to change schools or to arrive in, in, some, in, in university and not have any friends. And, and the way that you make space for yourself when you're moving into that new environment um, is, is kind of the way that a newcomer feels coming into a community that's, that's fairly tight-knit in terms of open source. And also, you can think of all of the things that your local communities do to integrate new people coming into the community. So having a welcoming committee, which might seem like a, a trivial idea, is something that most projects don't think about. So some lessons, I think, that we can learn from all of these situations, all of these other people who have done this well in the past, is, is first, don't bite 
of more than you can chew. This is something I said earlier, uh, fail fast. And this was, again, something that uh, Zach Erlocker presentation. Is Zach still here today? You are? No, no, he isn't. No? No, I think Zach had to hire some people. Oh, bummer. That's what he does. Yeah. So, so one of the things that one of the slides yesterday said, uh, um, one of the pieces of advice was have somebody commit code, have somebody fix something within the first two days in the company. And I think that's uh, vital when you're trying to recruit new, new people into a community as well, is you have like two hour tasks, right? Bite-sized tasks. If, if somebody who's a senior developer in your community says, uh, I can do this in two hours, then that's going to take a new student or a new apprentice coming into the project a couple of days, right? Just to get up to speed. And if he's not succeeding within that couple of days to get something done and sort of feel good about himself, well then, you're going to be spending too much time on him, and he's going to be spending too much time to fail and be depressed and go away and his time wasted all around. So, small bite-sized tasks. And, and kind of the, the, the downside of this is it's going to take as much time to maintain those lists of tasks as it's going to actually take if, if somebody was doing them themselves. And I think having the right barriers to entry. Um, again, this goes back to fail fast, is, is if, if you are setting some kind of an entry level where you expect people, and this is one of the things that comes out of the Google Summer of Code Advice pack that goes out to communities these days, is make sure that people are building your code and, and know how to actually, you know, know how to do what you're going to be expecting them to do in the project afterwards. So, uh, uh, again, Kosuke's presentation yesterday was great on this point. Is uh, What's your first experience when you're checking out the code? What's your first experience when you want to compile the code, make a patch? Is it made easy? Is it documented? Uh, and can you point new apprentices at that and say, okay, do that first and then come back in a half an hour when you're done and we'll give you a task. Um, I think this is the key point that I want to emphasize here is that you need to grow relationships. We have in the Google Summer of Code, we've got this culture of associating students with tasks. Right? So when you finish a task, you're done and you move on to another task and that task has a mentor associated with it as well. So you end up having a, a different mentor. I think it's important to have uh, kind of like the, um, the apprentice-master uh, relationship, that somebody gets taken under their wing. So you've got one guy who follows you from when you go into the, the, the mentorship program right through the way until you leave it, and, and he is your, your sensei. Right? He is your, the, the man that has your back. And this is executive mentorship, I think, is something that they do well, is, is you have um, some things that they, the simple things they put in there uh, to, uh, to maintain relationships, things like having monthly meetings. Right? Things like having um, uh, the same guy following you for two years and then you don't need him anymore and you take on a new guy. And that's the next point, is that you turn your students into mentors. You make sure that uh, Leslie Hawthorne in LCA said that your newcomers are the guys who know everything that you've forgotten. Right? Uh, your new students, the people coming in, are the guys who know how hard it is to work with your project for the first time. And you don't anymore, because you just do a, a SVN update and make, and it's all done, and all of your, your uh, dependencies are already installed, and all of, your, uh, all of the, the, the pain that you went through uh, with setting up pads or whatever it is, that's all done. Um, your new students don't have all of that existing, pre-existing knowledge. So, if you can turn your mentorship program into a mentor recruitment program as well, and make sure that when your apprentices are coming out of that uh, project for the first time and they're, they're going into their journeyman stage, that they're the ones who are taking new students under their wings uh, and newcomers under their wings, that is a way to first uh, give some value to your, uh, the people who've just come out of your mentorship program. Right, the people who are new students. So they're getting responsibility within the community straight away. They are a member of the community. They are citizens of your community because they now have some responsibility. And second, you are giving a student somebody that they can identify with, new apprentices somebody that they can identify with, to um, rather than somebody who's so senior from them that they like they're uh, we're not worthy. Right? Which, is, which is kind of a big problem in open source because uh, you know, people in open source projects get fanboyed all the time. And um, it's kind of scary because you know, the, the, the more senior developers in these projects do not feel like they are worthy of being fanboyed, right? But yet it happens. Um, and I think companies do this pretty well, right? I, I mean, uh, oftentimes what you'll see is, no, James disagrees with me. I, I know that in, uh, in, um, in Forex, Sorry, which Timo, is a company... Can you, Timo, can you turn down the volume a little bit? We have hungover people here, and it's just too loud. Oh, let me... Thank I, you. I can also move this away from my mouth. Well, either one, it's just... 
You're, okay. you're being a bit overpowering. And, Sorry. And I'm one to talk. Sorry. Um, so when I worked for Informix, so my first job, I was uh, paired up with a guy who'd been there for six months, right? which I thought was a nice thing to do because all of a sudden, is this, can anybody hear me now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, and I, I feel like I'm repeating th stuff that ever, other people have said all day. It's, uh, so like Donnie said, keep track. Like Steven said, you have the numbers, right? Uh, if you can keep track of your mentor program and just figure out what's working, what's not working, not everybody is cut out to be a mentor. So if you've got a guy who's got a failure rate that's way up, just say, okay, no more students for you. You go off in the back room and code and, and we'll leave you alone, right? And if you've got somebody else who is uh, really, really enthusiastic about taking on students, well then, you know, full on. Uh, turn the dial up to 11. Uh, Donnie mentioned some of the community metrics that you can, that, that, uh, you can get out of mailing lists. Uh, IRC Kosuke mentioned community metrics as a, as a sale funnel. Uh, well, no, you mentioned you know, concentrating on your, on your experiences as a kind of a sale funnel. You can get metrics because, like, um, so downloads to posts in forums to posts on mailing lists to creating bugs to fixing bugs to patches in Bugzilla in, in, in Subversion. You can get all that funnel and see where your fall off is. So keep track, keep track. It's, it's something that's, uh, that's vital to keep these, uh, these mentorship programs uh, good. So uh, that's pretty much all I got. I, went, I zoomed through that because I, I know that you're... Uh, did I zoom through that? Uh, that was awesome. I mean, I, don't, I think that was just perfect. Okay, so thank you very much and happy community gardening. <laughs>